Thank you very much, Adam, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Igal. You know me by HMM Copy on Twitter, probably. I'm just going to run through this. So let's ju just jump straight into this. In the olden days, in Z01, you were told that the R parameter in Z0, our favorite type parameter, was used to basically uh, anything. You, if you needed to specify dependencies to your functions, you would list them out in uh, Z0. Uh, so anything from database to clocks to logging, etc., you would put right there, and the rest is history. It grew and grew, and many of you probably uh, either liked it or not. When ZO2 came along, there was a little bit of a change in the, in the direction how we uh, encur were encouraged to create services. So we said that dependencies that are global in nature, the things that are, have the lifetime of the entire applications, they should not go into the R parameter, they should go into the constructor arguments uh, of, the, of the function. So essentially your traits become simple traits, uh, you implement them using regular case classes, and you wire them using layers. So all of the dependencies you pull from layers and you wire them up. So this leads to a question then. If we pass the parameters in constructor arguments, what do we need the R parameter for? If the, if the return type is now UIO or task, if you're using throwables, what do we need the R parameter for? So not too long ago, John tweeted this. So it was a reply uh, to someone asking, uh, to clarify this, and so essentially this answer, the simple loss for zero environment kind of retcons the purpose of the R parameter. So it states two, uh, two things. So for global dependencies, just as we saw, they should go into, into the constructor arguments. So anything that you think about like can, that can be shared between many different services, things like uh, your databases, your other services, things like that, you should probably put them uh, in constructor arguments and, and pass them and wire them with layers. For other things that, that are said to be local dependencies, which needs to be introduced and eliminated, you should use the ZO environment. So the rest of this short talk will be uh, showing some of these things that are considered local dependencies and why, why it's actually uh, useful to put them in the R. Okay, let's quickly talk about this notion of eliminating, eliminating requirements. So we all know, of course, that uh, because the R parameter is contravariant, Scala is smart enough to kind of make it bigger. Every time you use two or more ZO functions together, it, it will glue together the, the environment and make it bigger. But you can also remove some of those uh, environments by using the, the provide APIs. So this is a mix, this is from ZO1, I think. Uh, the problem is Scala is not smart enough to figure out how to chop off a larger type, so you, you kind of have, have to help it. So in this app2 thing, you have to provide in the, uh, in the parentheses the remainder of what you want your color to provide. And just in the, in the, in, in the parentheses, you, you specify what you provide yourself. So here we're eliminating the clock, uh, well, I don't have the mouse pointer, but here we're eliminating the clock uh, dependency by providing it, but we have to specify that the console with database will be provided by someone else. And if you make a mistake here, you will get a very nasty type mismatch error, which I'm sure all of you uh, have met at one point or another. Uh, finally, when you, you know, you can continue providing uh, those partial dependencies uh, like this. And finally, when you're, when you're the last one, you, remind, you, you basically uh, meet zero any, which requires no, no more uh, parameters. But the point is, you can eliminate uh, requirements by using the provide APIs. And in zero one, this wasn't very pretty. This is why we have zero magic. And now uh, zero magic is also part of the zero two APIs. So it gives you much nicer errors. So to demonstrate the purpose of the R parameter, I'm going to uh, show you a couple of examples from actually the things that we use in the real world. So at work, we currently use Doobie for databases, as I'm sure many of you. But Doobie, as you probably know, uh, it has its own uh, connection I.O. type. It's a free monad, but it's a description of a JDBC operation that Doobie understands. What we want to do is we want to kind of bring it into Zio. There's a very cool library that's called Transact.io, or Transact.io as I call it. Uh, basically, it provides you with, with this uh, TZO uh, wrapper, which can take any uh, Doobie query and lift it into a Zio. It, it can make it, it can turn it into a Zio, into a Zio uh, uh, operation, and so you can mix it in any Zio uh, for comprehension. So we can, if you need to, you can mix it with the business logic. Now, notice that, um, that the Zio uh, contains uh, something that's called a connection. Now, this is not directly a JDBC connection, but this is a type provided by this uh, Transact.io library. 
specifying that to execute, to, to actually run this query, we need to provide it at some point with a JDBC connection. To do this, uh, we uh, need to basically transact on this operation. So the Transactio, Transactio uh, API provides us with a, 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 uh, various ways of actually executing this query by, by calling it transaction or die, which means in case there's, a, there's an error, it will uh, do a die on a fiber. Uh, there are many, many other ways of handling connection errors and stuff like that. Here's the easiest for illustration. But notice that uh, what it happens when I transact on this, on this operation, the connection uh, requirement gets eliminated. It gets satisfied. Now, because Transact.io is a library that was kind of born in the Z01 days, it, it specified that instead of connection, you have to provide it with the actual database. The database describes the actual database connection with the connection pool and stuff like that. So this would be a, a kind of a global dependency that not necessarily would have to be provided by the R, but here in this, with this library, it kind of has to be provided by the R. But the point is, it takes something that is a connection and requires you to eliminate it by transacting on it. By the way, if you're using Zio JDBC, it, opened, it, it more or less does the same approach. So if you prefer a Zeo native uh, solution without Doobie, uh, Zeo JDBC kind of works the same way. You can uh, create a query, wrapping it with select all, and this instead will give you something that requires a Z connection. This is, you can think of it as a marker interface. It's not really, it, it has some other things that it holds, but in order to transact, in order to execute something of a Z connection, you have to wrap it in transaction. So you can check out Zio JDBC, but both of them kind of follow the, both of these libraries follow the same pattern. So the pattern is you can temporarily introduce some sort of a requirement within the scope of your function. And it serves two purposes. First of all, you have to handle it, okay? You have to provide it somehow. But the intention here is that you not let it bubble outside, you not let it bubble all the way to main. If, you, if, if, that's, if that's your use case. So for example, in, in the database connection, you can have a class called queries, which will have all the database queries defined in, your, in whatever DSL that you choose. But then you have to transact on them in order to eliminate, to satisfy this, this connection. So if you somehow forgot to transact on your, on your JDBC query, you would let this connection requirement bubble all the way to the caller, and you'll know that you've done something wrong because you're not supposed to provide it in any other means. Okay, so that's just one example of using a typed requirement. So this is something that the compiler enforces you to, 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 to provide, but then eliminating within the same, uh, within the same uh, function or maybe a, a calling function. This sort of pattern uh, makes an appearance in many, many, many places, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have them all listed here, but one other example is uh, the scopes in ZO2. This was something that also was uh, kind of introduced in ZO2, replacing uh, using ZManage directly. So a scope is something that has to be provided to the function to, to, to basically tell it uh, that we are using kind of a managed scope right now in this, in this function. So the ZO acquire release API, it takes a function for, for acquiring a resource and for releasing a resource, but it introduces a requirement that's called scope. Now, there are, there are two ways to satisfy this requirement. You can either use the zeo.scoped operator, which will create a new scope, whatever new scope means right now, and it will eliminate this. Notice that the return type is no longer requiring any scope, it requires any. So zeo.scope will create a new scope and will provide it to the zeo. And by the way, in zeo2, if, if you don't use zeo.scope, it will bubble all the way up to the run method, and run method provides you with the global scope. You can check this out. But the idea here, and this is kind of the takeaway I want you to have from this little talk. The scoped API, which doesn't look like this really, but, but for, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, uh, this is what it looks like. It takes in any zeal that is defined to have scope with R, okay? So think about, you can have combinators that require your effects to have specific uh, specific, you know, requirements on them. And then the return type is just the R. So we don't care what other things your zeo effect might require. All, all that we say we require any zeo that has R with scope, and we return it without the scope. So this scope.make creates a new scope, and the use parameter uh, basically provides it. But we can think about this. Look at the third bullet point. So this would be the equivalent of providing some layer to Zio 
saying that the R, whatever R is, is being provided by the outside, but we're only going to give it a new scope. And I forgot to close the parenthesis there. Uh, yay. So in conclusion, this, sorry, this can be used for anything, and at work we use this for a couple of things, for context propagation, or for authentication. Think about this, like if you have your endpoint, you can, uh, you can uh, force your functions to take additional requirement for user context, and you have to inject your user context, whatever that means, into your runtimes, and, and take action on those user contexts. This is very vague, I'm just going to give you one last example, uh, which I don't unfortunately have the code for it here, but what we use this for is to capture domain events. So what we say, we have a long running operation, and in that operation we want to emit uh, events that we want to dispatch at a later time. We want to dispatch it separately uh, you know, from another Zeo stream. So what we do is we create essentially something that's called a requirement that's called domain events. That requirement is holding a ref of list of events. We write events to this list inside of our long running operation. And then finally, we satisfy this uh, requirement by essentially creating a new list. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the code here, but we're creating a new list. We are uh, you know, providing it to our computation, so we get back the list of events, and then we dispatch it. Never mind. Uh, the point here is that you can use this for anything that's temporary, temporary or transitive in nature to kind of... Uh, Use your own imagination, but you can do this because it is typed, it is enforced by the compiler, and it is an alternative to do this with implicits or fiber locals or whatever. This, this will be on the signature. There's no escaping it. There's no way for you to forget to kind of handle uh, these requirements. So um, actually, all of this is documented, as I found. Uh, you can go to the uh, documentation and find more uh, details about general use of the Zeo service pattern. And uh, there's a section about the three laws of Zeo environment. I'm not sure if it's two or three. Uh, but it actually gives uh, some more examples and, and says that you should prefer, uh, prefer put things in the uh, constructor arguments and use uh, the R parameter just for those things that can be uh, introduced and eliminated uh, quickly. And the, uh, the tweet from John, I, am, I mean, you can, you can try to look this up, but just search for simpler laws from John and you'll find it. And you can paste it in your Slack for like general you know, guide, guidance on how to use the R parameter. So that was it. Uh, if you have questions, if I went too fast, please find me uh, or I'm HMM copy everywhere pretty much. And uh, thank you so much.